It's the second time this afternoon that we've heard if the ANC EFF alliance or coalition occurs after 2024, that it is the worst possible scenario. Helen said it last night as well. Why? Well, I guess, you know, the assumption one makes if that happens is that the looting and the hollowing out of institutions and society will accelerate. Um, and against such a backdrop, even with valuation on your side, it can be very hard to make money. All right, let's take it one step further. If you could have gone back five years and presumed at that stage that the looting and hollowing out would end under Ramaphosa, and as history has shown us, it hasn't, would you not then have actually reassessed and said, well, if that's going to continue into the future, why are you even bothering? So, so five, uh, you know, three to five years ago, valuation was also on your side, and it has turned out fine in terms of investing. It's turned out fine. Um, but things haven't deteriorated as rapidly as they might have, or they will if the NCFF comes into power. Then things will deteriorate more rapidly. I think that is a negative consequence. So I, I think one has to compare yourself maybe to Zimbabwe, um, you know, things went backwards at pace in Zimbabwe and they deteriorated really badly to a point where there was basically nothing left in the economy. Um, and it was very hard as an investor to make money there. Um, it wasn't a great investment environment, despite cheap valuations even 10, 15 years ago. It's very hard to make money because of the rapid hollowing out of society and institutions. And then the question I asked Magnus, who, as we all know here, has been a bear on South Africa for a long time was if we have the Rainbow Coalition assuming power in this country in 2024, how would that change the scenario? Well, then I think our assets here would fly. It would be, it, 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 it'd be the best performing country in the world in terms of investment performance, if Why? that happened. Why? Because then you have long-term investors who would recognize that structures would remain intact, would be strengthened, looting would, uh, would uh, reduce... Look, all politicians loot, just some politicians loot more than others. Looting would reduce. Uh, it would be a better environment in which to make long-term investment decisions for businesses, which is a good environment for investors. So, and, and at the moment, shares are discounting a bad outcome. Not the worst outcome, but they're discounting a bad outcome. So if you have any better outcome, then share prices will re-rate quite dramatically. I mean, as I said, the banks on fees of 7 or 8 in South Africa, you know, why not... In the, P of 12 or 13 if things normalize, which is, you know, where they should trade. That's a 50% uplift just in capital value. And then you've got growth of 20% carrying on because now people are investing. I, I, I'm struggling a little bit here because it sounds very binary. It sounds like 2024, there's ANC-EFF coalition, all hell's going to break loose. The rainbow coalition comes in, we go to the moon. So, and that's a problem we don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. You don't know what's going to happen. How do you deal with this lack of knowledge? Uh, the way I like to deal with it is to have a portfolio which has uh, different assets which will react to different environments uh, so that, a so if we have the ANC EFF coalition, a portion of your portfolio, your offshore portion of your portfolio will do well because the RAND will completely tank. So the offshore portion will do fine and your onshore portion will do poorly. But if the DA wins the election, your onshore portion is going to shoot the lights out, the RAND is going to strengthen, your offshore portion is going to do poorly. But sitting here today, we don't know what's going to happen. So each person will have their own view on the odds of different outcomes and let's say you think it's a 50-50 probability that the DA wins the election, you probably allocate up to 50% of your assets to Africa. But if you are more of a pessimist, like I am, and you think there's only like a 5% chance that the DA will win the election, maybe you'll allocate a lot less of your assets to South Africa. But the point is you will still allocate a portion of it to South Africa because the chance is not naught. There is a chance of a positive outcome. And the assets are not pricing that in at all. And... Then you have this middle ground of not the best outcome, but also not the worst outcome. 
And that is what assets are basically pricing in in South Africa at the moment. If that happens, then you're going to earn 8% dividend yield, and that's going to grow the economy, and that's not a bad return either. Um, so there's different ways to win. What are they pricing in? What are they telling us as a price? They're telling us that the economy is going to, well, it's not declining, it's still growing, but it's growing 1% or 2%. The assets are saying the economy is going to go into terminal decline effectively. There will be no growth or negative growth going forward. But in that scenario, there are still opportunities because valuations are on your side. Is that that's the, right, that's the bottom line? That's, yeah. that's the thesis. And, and you allocate according to your probability of different outcomes because you don't know what the outcomes are. If you knew that the ANC EFF is going to win, uh, if you had a lot of certainty about that, then you would take most of your money offshore, which might not be a bad idea. But I would still allocate a portion to this country because valuations are so attractive. And you've got the cycle behind you, which is also pushing a bit. I liked what you were saying about privatization and the sleeping socialists, because it's almost inconceivable. Two years ago, two years ago, March 2021, before Cyril released the cap from uh, one megawatt on power plots to 100, it was inconceivable that the ANC government would release its stranglehold on the production of electricity. It's been forced to do that. It seems like it's going to be forced to do the same thing with Transnet as well. That, that's, I suppose you can't say it's a guarantee, but it's a very, very strong probability that that's the direction we're heading. Are there sectors in the market? Are there stocks in the market? I know Roynet is, is, is one that has benefited a lot already that would benefit further from this kind of almost certain result. Yeah, I, I think banks and financial service companies will benefit tremendously from that. The guys who provide the finance for private companies to build or buy their own generation ability will definitely benefit from this process. So, And that's why banks is on my list of investments to look at because um, they will definitely benefit. Doesn't that also mean, and I, I know we've had a quite a bit of commenting on uh, Biz News about this privatization by stealth, that the privatization by stealth occurring in South Africa is despite what the politicians might want to do, is going to turn this economy into something, well, a lot brighter, or the future a lot brighter than most of us are seeing. It's possible. That is a possible outcome. Uh, I, I think that the, a, a privatized, decentralized economy is a much stronger and more resilient type of economy than a central planned socialist type environment. So if we get there, and uh, the signs are we are moving that direction, I think we can end up with, despite lack of government uh, or incapable government, despite our incapable government, I think we can end up in a fairly good space. Um, but, you know, I, I, I prefer not to be optimistic or pessimistic about things. I prefer to look at the valuations in front of me and act accordingly. And right now, those valuations are telling me that the market might be discounting a worse outcome than we might get, and therefore I will allocate some of my money to South African assets. It's, it's, that is the thrust of the argument. In the part of the discussion with Stafford, I read what Neil Ferguson had to say. I know you read a lot, uh, and Neil Ferguson is a prolific writer, indeed, on subjects of money. And his, not throwaway comment, but his comment that if he lived in a mad, bad country like South Africa, he would have a large percentage of his assets in Bitcoin. As it is, he doesn't have a single asset in because he doesn't live in South Africa. He lives elsewhere. Well, he lives in the UK, which is arguably worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He just doesn't know it. Yet. He just doesn't know it. <laughs> but but uh, your view on, on Bitcoin? So I, I think there's a place of Bitcoin. I, I think Bitcoin, um, Ethereum, these sort of dominant coins... Um, or you can actually call them programs rather than coins. I think coins is a bit of a misnomer. I think there's a, there, there's, a, there's a space for them. I think the killer app is exactly that in countries with unstable political systems, monetary systems, with uh, where um, you have more and more controls coming in in terms of movement of capital, that sort of thing. Uh, it, to move Bitcoins around the world is quite easy. Um, so that for me is a killer app for that, uh, for for these sort of uh, electronic tokens, if you want to call them that. Um, so I think it's, there's, there's a place for that. Uh, but at the end of the day, these things are commodities and their price are determined 
by the cost of mining them or hashing out the Bitcoin. The cost of that will determine the value of Bitcoin. And this crazy speculation goes on is, I mean, I think one should just disregard that because that's just pure speculation. The Bitcoin is not worth sixty thousand dollars because it only costs you fourteen or f- currently only fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars to produce a Bitcoin in terms of your rig that you have to buy and the energy it takes to do the necessary hashing to produce a Bitcoin is around fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars, and that's like any commodity that determines the value of that asset. But if you then go back to the beginning, the very first question about the possibility of an ANC EFF coalition ruling this country after 2024 and the consequences there, thereof, then surely Bitcoin becomes more valuable to people living here with that poten- a potential around the corner. Yeah, it becomes valuable in the sense that it, you can own an asset which is freely transferable overseas, but it doesn't make it intrinsically more valuable. It's just for you, it has, but for the rest of the world, it has exactly the same value. But you can swap it out for dollars. If, you, if the on and off ramps are available and free to use, which I think they're starting to clamp down on some of them. So that is a risk you're taking by owning Bitcoin or Ethereum or one of these things is that they clamp down on, the, on and off ramps. So there is a risk to any asset. doesn't matter how attractive it is. And that, therefore, again, you should approach this as a bundle of twigs problem. How much do you allocate to some of Bitcoin living in South Africa? And by the way, at the moment, exchange controls are basically for most people non-existence and stuff. In fact, they were relaxed in the a budget a year ago, even further. Um, so it's not like we need that right now, but you never know, things could change in the future. Uh, Pete, I know you are a voracious reader. You also gave us some recommendations. I, I mentioned to you earlier that uh, I've read uh, or am reading The Psychology of Money, one of Very your recommendations, superb book, which is there as well. Have you? Uh, can you tip us off on some of your other thoughts? Well, uh, I, I quite like Edward Chancellor. He can go on a bit. Uh, but his book, the price, the price of Time, which is all about interest rates and how they work and what effect they have on markets and so on, is, is, is a very good read. Um, uh, the other book I think I put, The Bond King, is just a story of um, the guy from Pimco who was a really good bond investor and his rise and fall, basically, which is I think is a, a life lesson for a lot of people. It's always good to read. Uh, about other people's, you know, business people's lives, the the successes they had and the mistakes they made. You can always learn from that. That's that that's quite valuable. Bull Gross, Bull Gross, yeah, the Bond King. That that's a great. Then it's a readable. It's a very readable book. What else was on that list? Oh, I forget now. The Berkshire Hathaway annual reports. The Berkshire Hathaway annual report. Oh, well, it's it's becoming a bit of a short read. So the, you can read that in ten minutes. The annual letter this year was like ten pages or eleven pages. So it's uh, it's quite short this year. Um, uh, how much do you read? I read as much as I can. I, I spend a lot of my day reading. I would say I'm probably, of the time I'm working, uh, and even not working, I'll probably read 70% of the time. When you're working? Even when I'm, reading is part of my job. But reading what? Reading annual reports, reading market commentary, analysis, books, articles, uh, all sorts of stuff. So expanding the mind. Yeah, and then trying just to understand, because I think that's our job uh, as a fund manager, is trying to understand the world around you relative to the set of asset prices that reflect that world. So you need to understand both of those things. Um, it's not one or the other. It's You need to understand both of those things. And I think if you read widely um, and try and get different points of view on board, I think that helps a lot in that uh, in that weighing up process of the world and what it looks like and asset prices and what they reflect. Right. I think you've given us all the information that, that <laughs> people want. Astoria, EPSA, the Spear Reed, that was a nice one. Southern Sun, Telcom, I disagree with you completely. Are they just so useless? Well, how can you go with us? I mean, really? Well, as I said, you know, um, undervalued securities always have a bit of smell to them. Uh, and Telcom does. Uh, it has a not bit. been a... Th- it has not been a well-managed business. You know, it's it's been predominantly governed owned for a long time. So, you know, that tells you um, what you need to know. Um, but it does have very valuable assets. It's towers, cell phone towers, and it's fiber assets. I mean, if you put valuations on those, those two assets they own that are being transacted out there in the market today, 
you can come up with a value of what of telecom just on base of those two assets of triple its current market value. Triple. Triple. So it's an asset. So asset. It's an asset play. It's not you're not you're not buying telecom because you think they've got a wonderful management team that is exploiting the market and making money out of delivering a good service to customers. That's not why buying telecom. Bit we're going to have a panel discussion with you, Sean and Sai, in a little while. But thank you for thank the you. insights you've given us now. And we look forward to welcoming you back in uh, an hour or so. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.